Bienvenidos. Uh, Do I need a beer while I've got them over here? Uh, buenos dias, uh, señores y señoritas. Uh, welcome. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thanks for coming to the Reality Institute, uh, hosted by the Control Room. Uh, my name is Michael Daniels Molito, and um, uh, it's been a great night so far. Has it? Everybody, give a round of applause for the great night. That so far. Everybody, turn to your right and look to the person there and say, "I love you," even though I never met you. been uh, around for millions of years. Uh, uh, our next reader is descended from uh, millions of years of evolution, uh, is uh, sort of a descendant of apes, an ape-like creature from uh, millions of years ago. Uh, everyone give a round of applause for uh, Lan Fam. Thank you, man. I mean, give a round of applause for Lan Fam. I'm sorry for making that mess. So, um, Mike and I bought that desk over there at a yard sale, and I found this sheaf of documents inside of it, mm -hmm. and I'm just going to read from the first, it's like compiled, well, it's like four different kinds of documents from what I can tell, so I'm just going to read the first page of each thing that's in here. First, here's a picture. And um, this is from a book that's called Our House. Okay. And this is what it looks like. Maybe you guys can help me figure out what it is. Okay. Today, a stray finger of the sun reaches into our home and finds the hair of a beast. It glints for me a robust golden brown. It is formed in the perfect likeness of a needle. Today we sit around the wooden table, smashing cherries against our lips. The maid dirties her apron with a purple-red stain in the shape of a country. It embraces her breasts and belly. Today we go to the graveyard to look at a coffin stuffed with flowers. I think of blue things and also the eye of a rabbit. There is water in the dirt. It roils beneath the sole of my shoe. My house is cool, its shadows lacy and bright. They move from room to room and I follow them. I decorate my body by lying in unlikely positions. I close my eyes and think myself a queen. I lay on the ground with my neck twisted into a stiff and regal arc and my eye finds the hair. It fixes on its glinting sheen. Today I cut my feet on pebbles when I walk to the woods. A thin veil of dust swallows my legs. I sample the flavor by tracing a clumsy line up my thigh. When the, when the finger comes to my tongue, it tastes like spiders. I find my beast to wrestle, his needle hair just like the needle of a compass. He stinks of ancient bugs. I wrap him in an embrace. So this is a document that's in three columns. And it's interrupted right there by a text box that, from what I can tell, has like production information about the movie Pet Cemetery. I'm not going to read that while I read. Gage is a baby of about two years old. He has yellow hair. Gage is played by an actor named Nico Hughes, born February 22, 1986. Gage was born in the same year as me. He is 25 days younger than me. I do not want Miko to have grown up and do not want to see pictures of him as an adult. Miko has gone on to have a B-list career. When I Google him, I find a picture of him holding an open pair of scissors to his tongue, his eyes circumspect. Gage gets run over by a 16-wheeler in the movie. He was chasing a kite. The kite is red. In the movie, Gage is placed in a tiny coffin. 
The coffin is knocked off of its stand during his funeral because Gage's grandfather, the father of his mother, believes that Gage's father is responsible for his death. My mother taught me that the word for the father of your mother is maternal grandfather. Gage's maternal grandfather screams at Gage's father in front of the entire congregation and punches him in the face. Gage's father is named Louis. My father is named Kwong. When Gage's coffin tumbles onto the floor, it opens to reveal his tiny hand, the shadow of his body in a little suit. A plot problem here is that if Gage were run over by a 16-wheeler, his body would not have re remained intact. There would be no perfect two-year-old body to have resurrected with a mere scratch on its forehead. Gage's body would have become something unthinkable. Maybe this is why the violence perpetrated on a child's body was allowed in this movie, because there is still a whole body afterwards. Gage was a smaller child than I was when I watched him die. When I watched his bloody sneaker skitter across the pavement for the first time and his father scream in some kind of appeal, his head turned to the sky. Gage was two years old at the time of his death. He weighed 24 pounds. His hand was blue in the moonlight when his father exhumed him. In 1987, I was two years old. I must have weighed 24 pounds at some point in my life, although that period in time is undocumented. In 1992, a coffin for me would have had to be just a bit bigger than Gage's. I was a small child. In first grade, my height in inches was a larger figure than my weight in pounds. My coffin, though bigger, would have carried a comparable amount of pathos. When I was in fourth grade, I watched a palm tree's fronds blow in the wind on the walk home from school. I told my best friend that I could not imagine the world without me in it. I pointed to the tree. That tree, for example, I said, I can't imagine it around. I can't imagine it without me around to look at it. So then that section goes on for a while. There's a picture of, of Miko Hughes holding the book Pet Cemetery. And then there's um, a JSTOR article page, but I went on JSTOR and this article isn't there anymore, so I don't know what's going on with it. Should I read you guys the abstract? Yeah. Do I have time? Okay, do I have time? <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna read it. Stephen King's 1986 novel, It, is deeply concerned with borders and their painful and inevitable breach. <coughs> There are ideological borders, those between social deviance and normalcy, between Oedipal propriety and transgression, between the racialized other and the white man. There are corporeal ones, between life and death, between prepubescence and adulthood, and the roiling territory that lies, between female virginity and corruption, purity and debasement. There are visual borders between the real and the filmic, the disguise for the hidden, and the horrifically apparent. There are psychological borders between aphasia and lucidity, the repressed memory and the present lived reality. And there is the fraught emotional border that lies between parents and their children. There are geographical borders as a line between civilization and an incorrigible landscape exerts a constant and brooding sense of unease. And the line between the fictional town of Derry and the underworld of its sewers constantly threatens to break, to spill contagion, feces, and waste. This article explores the pervasive use of borders as a mechanism of horror in King's contemporary novel, explicating the border as a polyphonic refraction which resounds throughout the text and serves as its most insidious and incisive source of terror and disorder. And then the actual article isn't there. Um, there's one more section in here, but I think I'm just going to leave it there. Thank you.